Cool, cool. Um, so why don't we just start with, or uh, I have to pull up what we're starting with actually, give me a second. Okay, first of all, thank you everybody for coming, um, for folks doing, for panelist folks, like thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is just really awesome. And to people attending, thank you. It's just really cool that we're doing this and people are responding well. Um, I'm gonna, before we introduce ourselves, I'm gonna pass it to Laura and Melissa to go over um, the guidelines that we're following, which was created by a uh, non-binary LA, or Neb I think it's uh, NBLA, Nebula. Um, and actually somebody on, uh, that I am connected to on Instagram watched the recording and then wrote to me and said, oh my God, I wrote those for Nebula. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, cool, so I'm gonna pass it to you, Laura Melissa. Sure. Um, is it possible that someone could screen share the guidelines just so other people can read along with me? Oh, and this is Lauren Melissa speaking. Matt, are you able to do that? Oh, I, I don't have the link for that. I'm sorry. Um, if you can... It's okay. I'll, um, I'll just read and then hopefully that can get uh, figured out behind the scenes. Okay. So, these are communication guidelines. Um, so first, we practice feeling-centered interactions by being mindful of potentially triggering language and actions and being mindful of our own triggers. And be remembering that this is not a group therapy space, which is, yeah, so I hope that people understand like this is a group space, but not a group therapy space. And there's a difference there. Speaking first to understand one another and then to be understood. So, you know, I feel heard, I'm important, but I also understand that this group is important. And I first want to understand the context of the comment that hurt me, and then seek for the group to understand why I was hurt by the comment. And lastly, we practice healing-centered interactions by scrapping societal requirements to perform wide social norms, including toxic positivity, neurotypical and holistic social norms, because those exist on both sides, and class status. So we practice learning, I'm sorry, we practice leaning into discomfort and challenging conversations by gaining awareness of how our intersecting privileges and oppressions inform how we interact with one another. Also, we're gonna practice being aware of tone policing and how our own biases may be reenacting oppression in this space. And lastly, we're going to be taking space, but also making space for one another. We're going to be valuing feedback as an act of generosity and trust by reflecting on feedback we receive before responding. And then the last point, number three, we're gonna practice respecting ourselves and each other by speaking with I statements from our own perspectives. So what this means like instead of saying you, or maybe even sometimes saying the royal we, saying I feel this way. We're gonna resist the urge to compare our neurodiverse journeys with one another. Unless, you know, like, you know, saying like, oh, meets, I think we understand what that means. Okay, I won't describe it. And then we're not gonna give unsolicited advice. But of course, if you want advice, you can solicit it. We can stay mindful of pronouns together here in this space and other gendered language. Remembering that we're telling our own stories and let's keep community members' identities confidential, only sharing outside of this space with explicit consent. Those are our guidelines. Thank you for reading those. It's, uh, I just actually messaged you because it just felt very calming how we keep read them. I appreciate it. Um, so we're just going to start by introducing ourselves uh, before we get into questions. Um, I can start. My name is Jersey. Uh, my pronouns are they and or he, so they can be used interchangeably. Um, like everybody here, I am autistic. Um, and I'm transgender and 
you will learn more about me as we go on, but I'm obsessed with my dog. Totally swiped that from Brandy from last time. I was like, oh, I should have added that in my intro. And yeah, how about I pass it to uh, Laura and Melissa. Okay, this is Lauren Melissa, also known as Autienelle. My pronouns are she, her. I am autistic, diagnosed at age 23, and I am also hypermobile and have dis dissociation disorder in terms of depersonalization, derealization disorder. And I'm really happy to be here to talk more about the autistic experience. I am also a biracial African-American woman with curly hair. My background is a headboard because I'm sitting on my bed because I had nowhere else to sit. And two paintings, one of the moon, one of the sun, and there's a flower and I'm wearing a jean jacket. I'm gonna pass it off to Sandra. Your voice is absolutely mesmerizing. <laughs> And I just loved how you uh, did your background there and uh, made that accessible. So I'm going to really copy that. I really, I really love that. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sandra. I am the writer and podcaster. I'm a teacher and I'm the person behind the ADHD Good Life. I'm diagnosed with ADHD and I self-diagnosed autistic. Um, I don't have a dog, but I would really love one. So I really enjoy seeing everyone's dogs on my IG feed. Thank you for that. Um, and I am Black. Uh, um, I am in my living room. I do have a picture on the wall. It's beige. There is some books in the background, but I'm wearing maybe a table. My kids. Oh, I have a kid. <laughs> He's seven. Um, and I um, also have some of his toys in the background and I have long dreadlocks and I wear white v-neck tee and a black color. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. And it's nine o'clock at night so I yeah, spoons are <laughs> very much less so I forgot I had to pass it on. <laughs> Um, Tiffy, are you ready? I know. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, you don't have to. I can pass it on to someone else. Ready? I think. Can you hear me? Hey. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Tiffany, Tiff, Tiffy. I answered all three. Um, I am the voice behind Fidgets and Fries. I am autistic. Uh, diagnosed 18 years old and then again at 36, uh, 35, like 35. Um, I have two kids, they're both autistic. Um, I don't even know what I wanted to say about them. Oh, um, Aiden, Josiah. Oh, I'm so tired, guys. Um, <laughs> married, live in Texas. Uh, I, oh, I like that background thing. I was doing so. Check this out. Uh, I'm in my corner of my master bedroom. Um, there's a bookshelf behind me with a bunch of knickknacks and books that just look pretty there. I don't read them, but they're there. Um, there's a weighted stuffed dog in my lap. This is a weighted stuffed dog. His name is Bear, and he's a dog. So that's fun. Um, I have on a gray shirt that says Trust Your Journey. I thought that was appropriate. A white, whatever this thing is, jacket, sweater. And um, I am a Black woman with uh, glasses on and headphones. And I am happy to be here with all these awesome and amazing people. And I want to pass it on to the other Tiffany. T did she say DJ? Tiffany. 
I don't think she's ready though. Oh, are you ready? <laughs> Hi everyone. I am Tiffany from Nice Functioning Autism. My pronouns are she, they, he. I have two autistic teens and a preteen as a single mom. I was diagnosed with autism as a teen during burnout my first year of college and again during a burnout in my early 30s. I also have epilepsy, ADHD, OCD, and anxiety. I am gender non-conforming and would love to see the community work to solve tough things. I am a black woman with a light green headband, green earrings, and a black shirt that reads in multicolors with a bare dark gray background. Pass it to, how about Matt? Hi, I'm Matt. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I run the Instagram page, Spectrum Me Matt. I'm also the technical guru for any problems anyone has around here. Uh, so if you have a problem, just direct message me and I will try and help out. Uh, I'm married to Brandy of the Chronic Couple and uh, I guess I'll pass it on to her. Oh, and I have a gaming background. There you go. <laughs> uh, my name is Brandy. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am 40 years old and was diagnosed as autistic um, with Matt actually at the same time when I was 38. Um, and we live in Asheville, North Carolina, and our dog Scarlet is the center of our universe. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I enjoy singing. And let's see, um, I have a pink picture behind me that I took when Matt and I were on vacation in Puerto Rico. That is one of my favorite pictures and it's of a pink house with a brick sidewalk and a door with really ornate um, wire things and um, uh, at, the, at the front. And um, I am a fair skinned um, mixed indigenous woman, um, white and Cherokee. And I have feathers in my hair that I got from Cherokee, North Carolina, which is about an hour and a half away. And so I'm going to pass it to Maisie. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone again. My name is Macy Satantiero. I am uh, very late diagnosed uh, at the age of 50. And um, I am the nonprofit founder of uh, here in San Francisco Bay Area. And the nonprofit is called Autism Career Pathways. Let's see, um, I have auditory processing disorder and sensory processing disorder. I, I have worked with autistic kids and actually autistic people of all ages and different talents and abilities uh, for over 30 years now um, as a coach, a family coach, basically. Um, I am Asian American, born and raised in Indonesia. I'm very passionate about uh, changing the mindset of uh, autistic people in Asia so they can proudly wear their badge as autistic and no longer hide and can advocate for autistic kids uh, in that part of the world. Uh, okay, what is interesting behind me? That painting came from the Philippines from my aunt. Uh, I also have a non-speaking, um, uh, Down syndrome aunt, my mom's youngest sister. So in my family, um, I think uh, neurodivergence outnumber neurotypicals, and we're very, very proud of that. It's part of our family culture. What else is interesting about me in a different universe? I think I would like to be a mermaid because water is my element. And I would love to have this job, which is a volunteer position, you know, in a big aquarium as a scuba diver. So I can go in there and wave to people and interact without having to actually speak to people. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I would really like that actually. Uh, okay, so I will pass it along to T. Hey everyone, I'm gonna be just 
reading a bit for T. And they say, I am T, my pronouns are they, them. I run the Instagram unmasked. That's with two N's, isn't it, or three? Um, I was diagnosed at 23 as autistic and ADHD, also a black femme. I am a singer, dancer, and artist. I have auditory processing disorder, anxiety, dyspraxia, and selective mutism. I like Pokemon, and I like to watch people stream on Twitch. I want to work with autistic people in the future. Have we all gone? Wow, good job of us. <laughs> that was like, I should have had asked someone else to start because the the background, it just got real exciting. <laughs> I was like, oh man, missed opportunity. Uh, pretty much behind me, you're seeing my whole house. There's like a little slither of a kitchen and a bathroom, my bed's on the floor. It, it kind of looks fancy in Zoom, I realize, but it's very small. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to jump into questions um, and, and to let people in the chat know, um, I keep my chat closed because uh, I, I, I enjoy reading it. So it distracts me. Um, so if you want to get a message to someone, if not, don't send it to me <laughs> or don't like I'm not probably not going to answer. Um, OK, so why don't we just start with and this is inspired by uh, a post. Um, Tiffany uh, from Fidgets and Fries put up. Uh, what does autistic mean to you all? Be what does being autistic mean to you all? And anyone can start. I, I can go, I think. Okay, so um, I think what being autistic means to me is that I see the world in the way that I was intended to and that I claim ownership of its divergence from societal norms, if that makes sense. Um, it's like, I am human in like every sense of the word and so autism allows me to get in touch with those parts of myself that others hide for like fear of like judgment or condemnation or ridicule or any of that stuff. Because as much as I try to hide it a lot or mask it, it it comes through it sh it shines through in so many different ways and when i just allow myself to lean into that then that's when i see the world more clearly and it's like brighter and it's more vibrant and beautiful and amazing even though there's just so many challenges and so many things going around it's just when I can just sit and accept who I am then that's when everything just like clicks and to be autistic is to like belong to this like really rich and unique culture it's like you can't really describe it with like one feeling or like one word. It's just like everything. It's like belonging and art and performance and history and community and and just it empowers me just as much as any other part of me does. Just like woman, just like black, just like mother, just like daughter, sister, friend, neighbor, US citizen. It just everything. And so, yeah, I hope all that made sense because I'm just I'm tired and I'm rambling. So it's like everything's just kind of like coming out. No, that it totally so. <laughs> makes sense. And, um, yeah, can I just go for it? That's what I was pop in with what uh, T have, have written. 
Uh, they say not to be negative, but for me to be autistic is to be misunderstood, to keep the awe I had as a child, but the wisdom as an adult. To be autistic is to live intensely, but beautifully. I know I Me? personally can relate. To, oh, go on. Go on, Lori Melissa. You go. <laughs> okay. I, I was like, oh, we're, I, I, I couldn't tell what you were telling. I was like, wait, are they telling me to go? I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say both of those are incredibly relatable to me. Like, I was thinking how it's so wild to go my whole life not knowing I'm autistic and then learn I'm autistic and realize it informs everything I do like and everything about me like even my gender identity even like my day-to-day -day things like I have to do people I run into like how I socialize how like I feel like my brain works in these really unique interesting ways like creating things like this and it's very, it's, it's like something a lot of people I know would find very challenging and difficult. And while it's work, it's like, I can just see all the steps, but something like paying a bill is that like, that is a task not many people like, but people do it. And it's, it's not very challenging for them, you know? And so like, I was always so hard on myself for finding such like simple tasks, things that are referred to as simple as difficult until I started to realize, like I actually said to my therapist once, I was like, I don't know why all these like simple things are so hard for me. And she said back to me, like, if they're hard for you, they're not simple. And it was like this moment for me where I realized I was basing everything I did off like neurotypical standards and Yeah, that really being uh, autistic means sense. to me being totally in tune to the out. Being autistic means to me being totally in tune to the outside and incongruent on the inside. Meaning, what's going on in inside is usually so different than what others perceive. It's always in the background. Wait. Wait. It's always in the background and foreground of my existence at the same time. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. So I agree with this formula and I agree with both DJ and Jersey as well that um, being autistic is definitely something that's very often invisible, not always. But a lot of time, I feel like other people don't see it a lot of the time. And then yet, when they do see it, they see it really strongly. And so the same people who tell me, which they tell me this much to my frustration, that you don't look that autistic, don't worry about it, which we can get to that statement another day. But the same people who tell me that are the same people who, more often than not, when I do appear autistic to them, they are very quick to criticize and reject me. At the same time though, I do think that for me being autistic is something that I am proud of, that I was overjoyed to learn about, that um, not only was it something that told me about my individual experiences that I'd felt but didn't have a word for, being autistic has also connected me with other autistics who are similar to me and has introduced me to a community of people I think a lot of the time when I think, when even I personally think of autism, I think of miscommunications, misunderstandings, but I've been trying to grow and thinking about the double empathy problem and how when I speak with other neurodivergents, a lot of that miscommunication and misunderstanding goes away. And so even that thought process of me being um, misunderstood, which I feel very regularly is 
an element of an ableist mindset on what autism is. So trying to get rid of that internalized ableism within myself. And I could keep going, but we have other panelists. So I'm gonna stop. <laughs> um, so I can tell you that I agree with everything everyone is saying um, and relate to all of it. But um, also for me, um, thinking that I was neurotypical for 38 years and then realizing that I was autistic, it was like freedom. It was like freedom to start trying to find who I really am. And the biggest thing is it gave me a reason to stop hating myself um, because I basically like just took everything and blamed everything on me. And then um, when I realized that I was autistic, it was like this whole world opened up where I connected with other people like myself and I didn't feel alone anymore. And all of those things that people made fun of me for or told me that was wrong about myself weren't. <laughs> and um, it was like, uh, I found other people that, that helped me to realize that. So it was freedom to start to get to know who I really am because I had masked for so long that I had no idea. So that's what it was. <laughs> I, I couldn't go next. Uh, I think for me, I um, uh, wanted to share about a uh, relationship and uh, shared experiences post-diagnosis. I think, um, first of all, it gave me peace and tremendous understanding um, when it comes to living with other people and my loved ones and to think back and forgive, also forgive other people. Because I think when I was a little girl, it was like a whack-a-mole, like uh, my mom was the no only neurotypical one. <laughs> and it was like a whack-a-mole, just people having like sensory burnout. It was really, really hard for her. I wish she's here today that I could um, have a chat with her. And, you know, she's not here anymore, but sorry emotional but yeah just to, it allows me to be um kinder and more understanding um when it comes to like being a parent being wife um being a mentor um and always like know that uh there's always the other side of the story um so and just thinking back and understanding the about the broken relationship and challenges with uh, other family members and relatives and how we would go on and on not talking forever because somebody was being really, really direct and uh, we heard each other's feelings. But now I am understanding the why's better and it's, it's really amazing to be able to reconnect with um, family members and friends and be able to mend that relationship and with my new understanding of my uh, identity as an autistic person and also other people's identity in my family who is, yeah, who are um, also um, uh, potentially their neurodivergence and we just have a different way of communication and uh, like expressing our care is very different qualitatively. So I think that's uh, amazing to be able to live like that. That's all. Um, Go ahead, Matt. Oh yeah, we, we've got um, someone that just, I just want to point out, um, uh, TJ, someone really wants to know your uh, voice app that you use. Um, if you could share that with us at some point. Sorry, Sandra, you can go ahead. Yeah, I just, I had sent, I actually had sent CJ that question. So, cool. Um, yes, meaning, right? What does it mean to me? I'm still learning. Um, it's pretty new for me uh, in the last, uh, I think about like maybe eight months, 10 months. Um, and like I'm in my early 40s, so it's um, it's a big learning curve because um, you know I when I first got diagnosed with ADHD and I started taking medication for that, like 
I was like, okay, this is done. Okay, problems, everything's solved. I'm good. I'm good. Um, so I wasn't really expecting that. And um, so it, and also I'm, I'm also a transracial adoptee. So I'm not knowing who my biological parents are. And so it's kind of been really difficult to be able to even see like, you know, where all this could be like where it was from. I, I don't, um, it's not like a bad thing or a good thing to me. It's that I'm getting to know myself in this capacity sort of thing. Um, and it is it is quite um, different because how I know my, what anything that I know of my biological mother is that um, when she came over to Canada, that's where I'm usually from, um, from Jamaica, um, she didn't talk to anyone. And so because of that, they had said that they thought that she was mentally slow. And um, yet, uh, and she was put in a home um, for people her age, she's like 17 or 18. Um, but uh, that, but she didn't, she didn't stay there because they, um, she learned everything that she needed to learn, but still couldn't do things like, um, like took after her finances or things like that. Um, but they um, still saw her as being someone who was not capable because of the fact that um, she really spoke. So I have a lot of these questions because so I don't really know where that all came from. So it's like I'm grateful to be learning through others um, in this community and to you know that you know self-diagnosis is really valid. And I, I think that um, I'm grateful for that because it's helped me actually even see like more of who I am because of that acceptance from others. So yeah. When I know more, I will share more, but it's still a journey for me. Does anyone else want to go who hasn't? Okay, then. Um... Oh, was Pete saying some things in the chat, possibly? I don't think so. I know you're doing that, Sandra, but I realized you were talking, so I'm not sure if Pete said anything. Okay, so um, we're going to jump into some questions about masking. Um, let's just start with, like, what is masking? Um, and uh, like with like with every question, like as many people, everyone can answer, or one person can answer. I'll when I feel like a pause, I'll ask like, does anyone else want to answer? And I genuinely mean it. It's not because I'm trying to get to the next thing. I just don't want to go to the next thing without checking in. Uh, so, yeah, what is masking? really want to answer but like my partner is talking in the background so I'm just gonna like try to wait so keep talking if someone else please answer because who knows when she'll stop yeah does anybody else want to answer uh, like I'll, I will if not but masking is when you are just being anybody else than who you are. That's what it is to me. Um, I have some experience with masking because I didn't realize that I was doing it for 38 years. I just had no idea that people had their own personalities. Um, I just became every bit, a little bit of everyone around me and mostly um, to keep the peace, to blend in. Um, even in school, 
I would not realize that I was doing this, but I would study people who were liked and people who other people respected. And then I would try to be that. And, um, and sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't, but what it ended up, ended up happening was I had a mental breakdown in seventh grade because I couldn't keep it up for any longer. It was too hard by the time, you know, that age I had masked for so long, pretending to, to blend in and it, the cognitive drain was just so much. And, um, after I got diagnosed, I realized, wait a minute, I or actually I was self-diagnosed for about a year. And then I got a professional diagnosis um, and I'm uh, ADHD autistic also. And, um, and I um, just realized, you know, like, like I need to start being myself and I need to stop being what other people want me to be. And um, when I started doing that, I lost family members. I lost friends. I lost close people in my life because they didn't like who I really was because I had just gone along with whatever, you know, chameleon type tendency that, um, that, you know, I had learned and it wasn't like I was being fake. I didn't know I was doing it. Um, and then when I realized what masking was, it clicked and it was like, oh, I do that. I've done that for so long and I'm not going to do that anymore. And, um, I know that there are certain instances where I have to do it, obviously, like, you know, um, it, you know, just to kind of, um, coexist sometimes like in, in settings, like in the grocery store, talking to the clerk or whatever, but, um, but as a whole with people that I care about and when possible, I am trying not to do that anymore and just be myself because it's okay if people don't like me. And, um, and so, yeah, that's something that, I, um, I, I'm, I'm learning cause I didn't know where I began and the masking started. And so now, yeah, it's, it's a lot easier mentally to just be myself instead of trying to stay one step ahead of who everybody wants me to be. And so, yeah. Um, I'll read for T. Uh, they also say, um, I also ended up in a mental collapse a very fascinating experience. I had a mental, I had a meltdown in the ward. And I would describe this experience as spiritual because when I was done, all pain was gone from my limbs. Uh, and they said, my senses are now stronger than they ever have been before. So the world is more overwhelming, but I am more present because I use my body, my headphones, my sunglasses instead of detaching um, from my surroundings. Masking was down to how I lifted my lips and a smile it is to spend your life on an operating table as people pose your limbs here and there just to shun you for acting like a robot. Yeah. That's really powerful, those words, yeah. Or being like a robot, um, I definitely relate to all the things being said. And I think masking is something that I am trying to undo. And it is something that I began when I was in the sixth grade and I started to get bullied for being myself. And I would lose friends, but I wouldn't just lose friends I would be afraid because I was that kid that couldn't go to the locker room, who couldn't um, go to the cafeteria, go to gym class without people picking me to pieces for not masking, for being myself. And I was genuinely afraid every day to go to school. I went to five different schools since the sixth grade. And at every school I tried to mask and reinvent myself and I would make new friends but then by the end of the year, I would lose all of them and they would never tell me why. I can vividly remember times when I hung out with friends, had a great time and then woke up the next day, went to school and none of them were my friends anymore. And none of them would tell me what I had done. And so I just kept trying and trying. I thought that I was inherently broken. So I need to keep fixing myself. And like what Brandy said, I was almost proud of myself for being able to become something that other people wanted. I would brag to people and I would say to them, 
I can be anything you want me to be. Just tell me what it is and I'll be it. And I thought everybody else was doing the same thing. But apparently they weren't because whenever I said that, it would kind of freak people out. So I kind of figured I shouldn't say that out loud either. Um, but that's kind of what I would do to survive. And now that I know that I'm autistic, with my close friends and family, I am trying to unmask more and more and more. And I'm doing a lot. I'm stem around them. I, I talk about my boundaries and things that I need, things that I like as well. But I think that at the same time, there is a survival aspect. I have to mask at work to keep my job. And that's hard. Even moments where I'm just joyful and stimming or sitting in weird positions or whatever, I get, it gets pointed out. Um, and so that's just something I'm still learning to navigate when I can mask and when I, when I have to mask and when I don't have to mask at work, trying to find that balance is difficult. But I am really excited because I'm changing jobs and at my new workplace, they know I'm autistic. So I'm like ready to go, ready to roll. Like this is gonna be the best. <laughs> the first time I've started a job with that knowledge being known. I saw this. Um... TikTok the other day. I, I wish I remember this person's name because I, I followed him on Instagram too. Um, but it was a TikTok about masking and it really was like uh, the, the way they worded it was just like so profound. And they went into how, um, yes, everybody does some type of masking, but they were saying like, I don't think people actually understand that autistic masking is changing like every part of your being, every part of yourself. There's, it's not like non-autistic masking where it's like, you know, changing things to fit a social situation. It's like, ch like changing something at your core that is like impossible to do forever, you know, <laughs> because it's like not who you are. And it just like hit me so hard. Even I can't like find the right words for it, but it literally like thinking about it gives me goosebumps. I'm just like, wow, that's so true. Because even for me, like, I don't understand what life is like for non-autistic people. I thought I did, you know, when I didn't know I was autistic. So sometimes it's very hard for me to even think of the difference. Like, what's the difference in how I mask as an autistic person versus, you know, my, uh, my good friends who aren't autistic and change their personality a bit according to who they're around. And it just really helped me understand it's that like, yeah, it's like, changing everything, you know, or like sometimes changing some things, but like being expected to be away, like you aren't at all, you know? And I think that's part of why it's so exhausting. And like you, like a lot of you all have said, I mentioned in the last live chat, man, I learned I was autistic after, I, I couldn't stop having seizures. Like it was unreal. Uh, I mentioned last time, like the, the kind of like final, I kept having seizures after this, but the really big seizure I had was like over 20 minutes unconscious. Before that one, I was having like multiple conscious seizures a day afterwards, like I sometimes 10 in a day, it was unreal. And a few months later, I learned I was autistic and like it comes. And so I, I have epileptic and non-epileptic seizures. And the, they have the same effect on me, but non-epileptic seizures are like caused by, well, epileptic seizures can be caused by stress too, but they don't impact your brain the same way. It's like, uh, I've described it to people, like if you have a headache from stress, we call it a stress headache, and it's gonna be different than like if you have a headache from the cold or eating something, uh, but they feel the same. And so like, Stress seizures, if they're not epileptic, you can, if your life changes a lot, if things get more comfortable for you, like you can really minimize them, sometimes make them go away. And so like learning I'm autistic was like a process I'm constantly going through of unmasking and completely changed my health. Like I can't even explain how much it changed my health. Um, 
Brandy said, look, people are saying things I'm writing down because I'm like, oh, that's so good. Um, Brandy, you said something about following people that were liked. When I started realizing I'm autistic, I talked to the one friend I had in person who I knew was autistic and open about it. I talked to them and I said that uh, it, one of the first things they asked me, they said, what were you like in high school? And I was like, I don't know. I was just like following crowd, like one crowd around it, to the next crowd. I, I don't really know how to explain how I was in high school. And they were like, ah, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, some of my family members called me bandwagon brandy because they were like, you just jump on the bandwagon with whoever you're with. <laughs> I'm like, well, I have survival technique. <laughs> I think too with the the whole masking part is uh, people don't understand how much it can actually appear as like you're lying like all, the whole thing like the, your name is Bob but your name is not Bob and it's like you just everything under the sun is just false about what you're presenting to people and it's so intense um, when you're so like just panicked with every word that's coming out of your mouth and I remember when Brandy and I first found out and we were having a really intense conversation and I could not communicate to her properly on being myself I, I just I, I had to have everything perfect I had to have everything you know all pieced together just right and that's not reality you know it, life is messy when we both found out we were autistic, we um, realized we had been masking with each other for like eight years. We didn't even know who each other, we didn't know who we were married to. And yeah. it was just like this like awakening where we had to like go through some stuff to, you know, realize like who, who we were. So yeah. Um, there is something also that uh, talking about masking that there are times when you have chronic pain and EDS, that it's like, I'm trying not to mask, but like with certain things with EDS, it's like you have to mask because you're in pain so much that if you're not masking, you're just going to be like crying. <laughs> so yeah, there are parts that in, in, in like at, at Matt's work, he can't unmask. And then I'm, I'm lucky that at my work, I can, they know I'm autistic. I work for an autistic dating app. So um, it's the first time I've ever been able to be, um, myself at my job so it's, it's going to be awesome Lauren Melissa I can't wait for you to know what that's like um because it's great <laughs> but yeah there are times that you just can't mask unmask and so it's yeah it's tough and then some people can't mask at all Matt's not very good at masking um he can do it for about five seconds and then he, he's just like I'm done <laughs> so yeah I guess uh, that we're going to get to that though how it you know it's a privilege sometimes if you can do it. I just, I have something to read for tea, but I also wanted to say something to what Matt said too. I, rem I remember these times vividly um, just with um, being around friends when I, when I was really like, well, I still mask a lot, but um, having into my, like the masking and just thinking to myself, they don't really know me at all. They don't know me, they think they do but they don't and think how wild is that? Like to, to know, and, and, but what's even worse is like, I didn't even really know me. I just knew that, like, like I knew that I wasn't me, but I didn't know where I was, there, like who I was. There was something that I, I think it was my autistic soul wrote that just, oh, like ripped my insides out when they were, they had written about unmasking being like, you know, you're trying to find the seed of yourself, but um, like, because you, you, you know, some of us have just masked for so long and then we get diagnosed and then we realize that we don't know who, we're, what we're unmasking to or who we're unmasking to. And that, when I read that, I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> that is exactly how I, feel like every day all the time with my partner we've been together for eight years as well and so this last you know eight months has has been that same sort of thing as Brandy and Matt were talking about is like us getting to know each other again <laughs> in a lot of ways and uh T has uh written to 
Um, the most harrowing part, harrowing part of masking is how many people I see I suspect to be autistic, but think masking is something everyone does. You can go your whole life, all of it, and believe who you started as was wrong. And I just feel that very, very deeply. Um, I'm just scrolling through to see if I missed anything else um, that team have added. Uh, religion, uh, as it was taught to me, was very damaging. I masked my experiences because I was taught they were evil. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, so definitely. I think growing up in the, I actually am still spiritual, but um, I was growing up, you know, in the Christian church, there were certain things like you had to you know, give in to physical touch in certain ways. I do like meet and greet, shake hands, um, give, do small talk, all this stuff. And if you weren't doing, if I wasn't doing it, then I was not really respecting community. I was being selfish. I was, uh, if I wasn't into the singing and the worship time, which by the way, like being told to like raise my hand, like raise your hands. So I'm like, that's a lie. I don't feel that way. I can't do that right now. Um, I would feel like I was lying. And then they'd be like, no, you're not giving into the spirit. You're like, or I'm refusing to lie to the spirit. Like it was like weird, but at the same time, I mean, I laugh about it now, but it was really painful. It was really hard. And I, I very much struggled going into houses of worship because there are such strict social rules and parameters for how to behave spiritually which is a problem in and of itself, but as an autistic person, I will not understand and I will not be able to follow or even have any desire to follow those social spiritual norms. Does anyone else wanna answer that before I just jump into another question about masking? Okay, I'm going to go for it. Um, uh, so yeah, our, and we've covered some of this, like, are you able to mask? Uh, but in addition to that, do you think masking is a privilege? Yeah. yeah. Did TJ want to go? Or... Um, I was going to share um, what TJ was having um writing in the chat and um i think anything people can do with choice of when and where and how to do it is a privilege that makes me wonder is masking in all situations a choice I don't have an answer for that, though. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, T has put down, and I don't know if I missed this from before or if this was related to the next this question here, but um, something I've noticed is autistic people think they mask well, but a lot of us don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was me laughing. <laughs> So true. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Neurotypicals pick up on it. Other autistics pick up on it. People might not know the word autism, but they know the word different. And I've never escaped that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is a very hard relate for me. Uh, I honestly thought I was a star at it. <laughs> How do I have any friends? Someone in the chat box, Eli, mentioned um, that they're not sure if masking is a choice for kids. And that makes me think about ABA and situations like that where masking is enforced. So whether or not that is a privilege to be able to pick it up or not, I think is very complex as well. Um, well, I, I can add to oh, that. Okay. Oh. Sorry, and TJ also clarified 
the choice and is not masking, it's the when, where, and how. Okay. And T is also the attitude. Um, I, I can share that uh, my son learned to mask very, very early on because he was told that he was going to be excluded in group activities unless he can behave properly. And to today, it makes me feel sad that he just, uh, um, he hides a lot of, you know, so he at home, fortunately at home is everyone unmasked, uh, but he knows he, he chooses not to do, um, to be himself when he's around other people. And that is his choice at this point. So I think for little kids who are in therapy um, and in school where they're expected to uh, respond in a certain way and when there are rewards being used uh, for them to perform according to neurotypical standards, I think it's masking for little kids. It's a survival mode. And I think it's really sad, really, really sad. Uh, because for me, unmasking and masking, unmasking is a survival mode. And for a lot of autistic kids, masking is a survival, survival mode and they don't have any way to unmask. They don't realize their hidden needs that they need to just have a safe zone to just stim and do all that. I know we're gonna talk about stims later, but that's just really, really heartbreaking. Uh, T has also put, um, I think the ability to mask is an advantage that keeps you from being detected because there are situations in which I can't mask. I can't pretend to understand things I don't. I wanted to add too, is like as a teacher, um, like, and I'm the, and I know I'm the first people on my own platform to like trash school systems. Like they just destroy, um, you know, any kind of thoughts that could be independent in a child. And I, I you know, I just, I don't even think it's like a, re a reward for masking. I honestly think it's more about like security, about safety, about like, it's not, oh, if you act like this, then you're gonna, you know, then we can treat you. It's like, if you act like this, we'll treat you better sort of thing that I've seen. And yeah, I just, I, I feel like, yeah, it's not really so much as a reward as like, yeah, just, you know, survive. Um, I'm going to pass it to Tiffany. Oh, um, I'm just, I agree with a lot that everybody said. It's just, I didn't know. Like I've written a lot about masking and unmasking and I just couldn't figure out what it was I wanted to say or, um, exactly how I wanted to say it because masking or the process of unmasking, it doesn't feel that I don't experience it the same way that so many other people do. Um, I'm a black woman growing up in the South, like, I, man, I, Black people have been masking since before we knew mask, what masking was. And you're, you're, you're four years old and your mom and your grandparents, they're teaching you, this is how you need to act so they don't do this to you. This is how you're supposed to be so they don't do this to you. When you go into this store, this is how you need to act. This is what you need to say. This is how you need to be. This is what you need to do. And you carry that 
to your job. You're, you're, you can't, don't wear your hair like that. You won't get that job. Don't, don't wear your natural. You, you won't, or, you know, don't wear this. Don't look like this. And this is stuff that neurotypical black people are teaching their kids. So it's, it's like, how do I explain masking from a strictly autistic vantage point when I have masking coming at me from another, they, they, cops look at me, they don't see she's autistic. They're, they're, I'm black. I am black first and, and the weird behavior that comes with it, well, that's just mean she's a threat. That's the ad, that's that. And so you have these layers of experiences and, and different traumas. And, and I know that there's like this little, like, I don't want to call it like a movement or something, but this, I, I, I seriously, sometimes I feel pressured with unmasking. There's like this new thing. And we, can, we can't be that. I want to be freer. Like, that's like the thing. I want to be more free. But I know I can't fully unmask. I, I, I know that. I know that I, that's something that, that I cannot do. And, and I'm trying so hard to figure out how do I teach my kids how to, sorry. Sorry, I don't want to. You don't cry. have to apologize for crying. No, yeah, because it's, no way. This is like the reality. Like we don't <clears throat> like wow. have that choice. We don't, and, and that's and that's the truth. It's and it, like and crazy. It's, it's crazy. like this. This is the way that it is, and it's not talked about. Like when you hear like this kind of oh, you should unmask more, or you should, yeah. you know, you're stressed out. Oh, you should unmask. It's like. Sorry, excuse my language, but we're my uh, beyond masking. Like you know, in my my bedroom, maybe I've masked so much. <laughs> you know, something happened in our private chat the today um, when uh, Jersey would ask Jersey would ask the question about like, are you you know doing unmasking now? And I was like, uh, no. And it is a joke. We were joking, but in reality, like we don't like I. You mask so much as black people. Like, I don't even know what, I don't even know if I will ever get to the core of who I am or who I am, or who I think I am or whatever. I don't know if I would ever get there. I just had to ask too, is like, I grew up with white people. I grew up in white spaces. I never even had to learn, got to learn that from somebody who, like my parents left me, but who knew what it was like to grow up being black and, and learning all of that on my own through like, you know, constant bullying from the time like I stepped into the school when I was like four years old and knew I was the only one. And to learn that and to be like, oh shit, I'm not supposed to be me. And nobody told me that, you know, and we just learned that. And it is serious because I was always spent on it. And that's the thing is that our lives depend on it. And uh, yeah, I wish we could see that's those wild. differences, know that difference, because that is a reality. Um, yeah. Our behaviors, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll say something real quick. My mom, she's a single mom. Um, she was neurodivergent herself, but um, she's schizophrenic and She's a mom, she's black. And she raised me, always telling me, don't do this, don't do this, be careful, don't do that, of course. But she also told me when I got diagnosed at 23 that she had always suspected it, but that she was like already too worried that I had too many things, too many things that could set me back in the education system, um, being black in a lot of white spaces. 
that she didn't ever pursue the diagnosis because she was worried that it would be too much. And I think I carried that, I've carried that support with myself into the workplace where I'm already trying to speak about like racial justice and, and, and um, racism, racial discrimination in the workplace and trying to advocate for that. Um, like, can I really also say, hi, I'm autistic too? Um, like, will it be too much? Will I lose my job? So feeling like I have to mask, I have to, it's still, I think, important to bring up that I do have the privilege to mask. I think that's true that I can opt into that because I could not opt into that and then I would have never gained access to that job in the first place. But it's not, I think it's not that I am privileged that I can mask, it's that I have gained access to some privileges because I could mask. That's good point. All right, well, I wasn't going to say that much. I'm sorry, Tiffany. I'm going to stop now. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> have some. It's she has like, some stuff to do to say to him. So. Oh, it was it was so it was like interesting, like when when Laura and Melissa was talking, and then when I think someone else had brought up like ABA, and it was just it was so interesting. It was um I remember like I can mask now somewhat, and I can only do that because my grandma, right? And so I was, I don't know if y'all like saw the Temple Grandin, the movie where like her mom kept holding up the um, the flashcards or something like, and she didn't get it. So she kept putting that, kept, like showing her, showing her and showing her. And, and that's like how it was. I wasn't understanding what it was she was asking of me and what it was that I needed to do and why I needed to do it. She was like, no, we have to get this, we have to get this. And it was just like over and over repeating and over and over and to get it. And it, and it wasn't because she was like, she was trying to change me fundamentally. She was trying to save me because she knew what was going to happen, what I was going to face. And it's just like, even with all that preparation, you still face it you still get it and you still like do not know like what's gonna happen. I literally was almost shot by a cop last year because uh, we bought a car and we didn't look like that should be our car. And I'm standing outside my car and my kid is in the car. He has no idea what's going on. He is starting to melt down and I'm trying to explain it and I almost always melt down when my kids do I just it just like kind of happens and I'm trying so hard to remember everything don't move don't fidget don't go for your pockets don't do this and then just like in your head you're trying to like and he's like what are you doing what are you doing and you see the hand on the gun and it's just like what do you do in all situations how do you prepare yourself or your child or anyone to to go through that how do you you do that and I feel like if I didn't have that that help and that guidance from my mom and my grandma it would have been worse it probably would have been worse and it's 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 sad that I want to live more free I feel like I co-opt all these different identities from different places and I pick up different things in different like areas like I find myself watching like procedural cop shows and I'm looking at these people like how they're behaving I'm like okay if I do that next time okay that'll yeah that'll, that'll help me now, I'm, I'm picking up stuff from fiction. Like, I, I, I'm trying to pull from all these different places. And I'm like, I don't know that I'll ever be able to be completely mask free or even like peel half mask. I don't know how to do it. And at the same time, like, what do I look like when I'm trying to like unmask and then I'm teaching my children how to mask at the same time? And I'm trying to teach myself how to do it. So, like, 
masking and unmasking just is like a complicated thing. And I thought I could explain it by separating it and, and, and addressing it more from an autistic standpoint. Then I was like, okay, then I'll get up just explain it that way. But I can't. It has to. It has to all go together. That's just something I can't fully like explain or get out. But yeah, I'm gonna stop it because I'm gonna start crying again. Y'all don't wanna see that. <laughs> oh. I was totally put... cheering up last time you started crying. So I was trying to message it to you, but there was like too much going on. I was like, whenever <laughs> I talk, I'll, I'll let them know. Yeah, I was totally tearing up. Um, uh, I keep writing things down people are saying, but I was listening to you say something while Rochelle and I didn't write it down, but something you said was like the perfect description as to like, like masking isn't a privilege it's and you said something that just really encaptured do you know what I'm talking because it's like even in hearing all this it's like yeah like the act of being able to mask like I, I wish there was a different word than privilege because you're like well that's not a privilege to like be black and autistic and have to mask like that like I get that the the be, having the ability, like the physical cognitive ability to mask, can be seen as a privilege. But like there, it, to me, it's so complicated because when people are put in a position where they have to mask, like like uh, we can talk about like jobs and school and stuff, but like for I mean like for your life, you know, like what Tiffany's talking about, it's like. That, that can't possibly be a privilege. <laughs> there, it, there needs to be some other way to describe what it means to like be able to unmask. And yeah, that's how, what this has all made me think of. Uh, Tiffany has, or I'm sorry, T has added, uh, I think I'm able to look at it purely from an autistic viewpoint because I'm not particularly good at code switching either. I genuinely don't leave my house a lot. And now that I have white support workers, I can do a little stim and not be accused of being on drugs. I often forget who I am and what I look like to a detriment. And I read that too. I thought of that, like how lucky you know, I was growing up to not know what, you know, how dangerous being different in those spaces was because I didn't learn that. And what made me mask was just being relentlessly bullied and teased and um, whatnot. I didn't learn um, the things that I should have learned from a parent because they didn't know to that, you know, what it was like, what it would be like to be me, just a black person. Uh, T also added here too, being black and autistic is pure confusion, more rules than a person can even follow. Yeah. Um, TJ has added something in the chat. Um, um, I was asked to share, um, there, is, there is reality and the way we have to live to continue living. Sometimes I can mask, but not all of the time. I have to mask in police encounters. I was pulled over last week and I was afraid, but I pulled up all of the energy I could muster to give eye contact and speak with confidence so I don't seem suspicious or on drugs. Losing the mask can be fatal in these situations. He's also added to, I did learn it, but I never understood it. Um, I just like really appreciate what everybody is sharing. Um, something T said about not knowing what you look like. And I don't know if you, you're referring to specifically like what you look like when you're unmasking versus masking. Uh, once I wrote down what you said, I was like, that could possibly be what they meant. But I meant like, I don't, something that's really odd about being autistic and transgender and medically transitioning is, um, being surprised by how I look like when I have these moments and I capture myself in the mirror and it, it's like a, a 
you know, the way I have changed in nine years physically is it's, it's always like very overwhelming for me. Um, it just made me think of that because I'm like, I yeah, I don't know what I look like ever. And I don't hear like that's not something I find in common with other trans people who aren't autistic. I hear it more from autistic people who, whether they've medically transitioned, whether they're cisgender, that people are like confused about what they look like. And so I feel it's a really interesting thing to like know that already exists and then have other people perceive you differently over time, how you look and like trying to adjust to that. Yeah, it made me think of that. Yeah, I just really appreciate what everyone's saying. Um, so are you masking now? I can say yes, I am because I'm in level like eight pain. Yeah. <laughs> for a different reason. I, this was the question where I put in the joke. Um, yeah, like I knew, I, I always, I pretty much always, I feel like I don't know any other way um, so right now. I would say that right now I am masking less. So I, I'm not always on the same level of masking. And in this moment right now, I'm still masking, but I'm not at like ultimate mask level. Like, um, but I actually just made like conscious choices because like Brandy, I am probably not as much as Brandy. I don't think I'm an eight. I have chronic pain and I'm in pain right now. So I'm not showing that, but I am permitting myself to like fidget and stem more. Cause I can't, I just don't have the pain level to like keep myself as still and not stem. So I've been fidgeting more and changing positions a lot more than I normally would. And I also chose to hold my little fluffy here, which I normally wouldn't do, but I feel like I'm in a safer space so I can do that. But I'm still masking. It's so funny because like I never even think of stuff like that because it is so new to me that to go from like just doing whatever the heck I wanted and I was living abroad um, too so um, in places where I was sort of the only one and you could do kind of different things but just be like the weird foreigner um, sort of thing like that <laughs> you know what I'm talking about and yes. then to <laughs> and then to learn about like to get you know diagnoses and stuff like that and then to learn about it and then be like holy shit like I need to be like you know and then it just pulls up you know pull back you know because especially because I'm now in the UK and stuff like that but then to realize that and I do I guess I am kind of running to sometimes I'm like oh wait a minute I do move around a lot more than I I do I think I do again I guess it goes back to that whole entire um you know when we think we're masking so awesome Banana, really you guys are supposed to be going out now I think that was for the kids for the kids yeah sorry <laughs> T also had put I'm just gonna wait for T now they had put um the subject matter is quite upsetting. I really have lost the ability to mask in most situations. I would have to relearn the things that caused me to have a mental collapse. The reality is so great. Um, yeah, they'd, also, sorry, go on. You go. They, they'd also written um, from earlier, um, just talking about like just the necessity for us to mask as black people, they, uh, they had written, you may have to come home and melt, but you live another day. So just really having to like keep it all inside and then, yeah. Um, I've noticed this about myself in other situations with all autistic people too. Uh, um, it's kind of like, well, let me give a, analogy like you know when you just have so much to do and like your nervous system's on like high drive uh, like it's just like oh there's so many to do so, so like that's trying to remember something try, just like getting all the things done I feel like my nervous system gets like really chaotic and then you have like a day 
where that's not happening, but it, your nervous system doesn't change. Like it keeps being like, oh, you have this thing to do and it. You like feel it physically. And it's like, I literally have nothing to do. Why is this happening? It reminds me of like how I feel when I'm communicating with non-autistic people, especially a group of people, like a hundred percent. I constantly have this thing come up where I'm like, did I make sense? Did I talk too long? I haven't spoken in a while, should I say something? And it ultimately makes me like close down most of the time. Uh, but like in a setting like this, I still feel it come up. And then I'm like, calm down. Like no one's judging you for how much you're talking. No one is expecting you to talk. Uh, like it's like I can reassure myself when I'm around other autistic people that I, I know I'm like always doing my best to like never be harmful in my language. And I, like, I'm okay being corrected with that. I believe that somebody here would tell me if I did like, I would just like, I would tell you because we're like upfront people and it can be hard to do, but it's hard to do because like somebody doesn't, we're used to such bad responses. So it's like very interesting to be in a space where I feel like, no, like my communication, the way I move, the way I like have to change the way, like like you were saying, where Melissa, like change the way I'm sitting. Like, I don't even know how many times I'll do it in one Zoom chat. It's like, like it still comes up. I like feel like I have to be different and then I like let it go. So um, I am masking because I'm going against my natural pull to move. So I, like an example would be like just looking at all of you guys. Uh, I love looking at, and not just because I respect all of you, but I, I, I care about being here and um, I, I trust this panel and using eye contact, but I feel so much better actually to look away most of the time that, and my battery lasts longer. And also with my processing difficulties, it's like folks, I'm pushing through and um, that's not my, it's not an easy thing for me to do in general. So after we're done, I have created a space for me to just do whatever. And I need that, I need that. Otherwise I would, it messes up with my head and my vision and these other things, but I'm sure you guys understand what I'm talking about. Just, you know, just, just staying focused, sitting still. And um, yeah, that's, that's not um, me normally, my true me, I suppose. Um, TJ has added, I am fortunate that I don't have to mask in my daily life in general. The majority of people in my life are neurodivergent themselves. When I lived with my husband, I had to mask every single day. He was not understanding, nor was his family supportive. Leaving him was the best thing I could ever do because I don't have to mask inside my own home. Growing up, I didn't have to so much, yet I did at home, not now. Does anybody else want to uh, say anything? I'll jump to the next part. Okay, so um, like, have you in the past or do you currently have any experiences of shame around your neurodivergence? I'll, I, I, if, if, uh, and I'm going to add like, what helps you be your authentic self? So we can answer one or both. So if you have any experiences of shame now or in your past of being neurodivergent and what helps you be your authentic self. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, and I'll type it in the chat too. Thank you, sorry. It had multiple parts. So I'm just yeah. like wanting to keep them all together. Sorry, can I read just one more thing that T had, had written about the last thing um, while we're waiting? 
um, with, um, I think it was in response to what had been written earlier. Uh, they said, like, I really am shit out of luck in a way. Oh, no, I'm using that. Um, if I maintain prolonged eye contact, I can't even hear what an authority just said. Survivor mode has to kick in. I have to think about what they might have said. I have to be hyper vigilant. Oh, there's so much of that. You going, Brandy? Okay. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody else is going to go. Um, the I subtitle think... thought I said she gone, not you going. That was like a really off one. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> I've done that. That's cool. <laughs> um, so for me, the shame has come now when I disclose that I'm autistic because people don't believe me. It's like I'm not shameful about being autistic. I feel the shame in people's reactions. And it's like, I have to convince them now that I'm autistic because they only know the masked me. And, um, and it's, it's just been like, it's made me somewhat hesitant to tell people that I've grown up with or people in my life um, that I've known for a while, like cousins that I don't see that often or something, because it's like, um, it's yeah, just instant, like um, this, this tone of like disbelief and, um, and that causes me to feel, I don't know, yeah. Like, I just wish people knew more about what autism actually is. Um, TJ has something. Um, going back to ba my bad relationship, I was shamed almost daily for my traits, whether it be for sounding like a robot, stimming, or not being able to speak well or without getting exhausted. He made a point to shame me about those traits. I actually don't care about strangers' opinions, so I feel nothing when they don't like my traits. Yeah. <laughs> T, T has written, shame mostly came from being compared to another person by everyone. I would add to for myself, I think more shame for me comes now just because of just being so early in comparison in my own journey, like this has only been the last few years. But when I look back on my life, on the things that I didn't understand, like just about society and just things in general that I never really caught on to or learned or, you know, um, and you know, what I've lost just with um, friendships quotes, and just, I feel like there's a lot of, I, I hold a lot of shame with that. Um, but knowing about the neurodivergent, you know, traits I have and conditions and whatnot is at least given me some answers. And I think now because I'm not around as many people and um, in the community a lot more, it is, a little easier, but I still feel like I have a lot to, uh, um, I'm still dealing with that. I'm still like kind of understanding and coming to terms with all of that and what all that time that has been, that's passed, just not knowing. And he is also written, <laughs> <laughs> they've also written shame especially comes from how delayed my processing can be i have not understood people were actually trying to harm me i have not understood that i should be embarrassed by something oh goodness hard to relate to that um what i think about after the fact i miss that um that can happen to me years after as well <laughs> I, yeah, just, I can really oh, go on. I feel a lot of shame, not a lot, but I go through experiences of shame when I get angry, when I've been pushed to my limit. Even just the other day, I was invited out to get drinks with some colleagues and I had said no, that I wasn't going to go because they kept changing the place. So I was setting a boundary and being like, 
this is too much. Like, you can't keep changing the place on me. Like, I'm not going to go. And this person knows that I'm autistic. Okay. So when I finally told them I'm not going to go, like, you guys keep inviting the people you want to invite. Keep picking the place that works for you. But I'm just, I'm going to tap out. They said, oh, no. Actually, it's really important to me that you go. So they put it back down to only four people total. And they invited me to the same place we had agreed on. And then in the next message, they changed the place again. And so I was like, okay, fine, fine. Like, we'll do this place because this is only four people. So I went, and then when I arrived, they all changed from getting drinks to getting dinner. Sounds small, but it was another change. It was another adjustment. I was already at a new place. And I said, so why did we go here anyway? Because we had gone there for the drinks. I didn't even really want to get drinks. And I snapped and everybody got really quiet. And then someone finally said, we're here to celebrate. And I was like, okay, we're here to celebrate. Um, and I felt a lot of shame because I wasn't able to keep it together. And now I'm thinking everybody thinks that I'm a control freak or everybody thinks that I'm you know, a bitch or this or that. And I, I felt ashamed that I wasn't able to not react. Um, I ended up at the end being like, no, like you totally got reasons to feel that way. And you're autistic and I'm, like, I'm autistic and I can work through this. But I, in the end, I, I did say to the people much later, you know, I snapped at you and I want to acknowledge that. And I just want to bring up, like remind everyone that I'm autistic and this is what was going on. And when I said it out loud, and I finally just said it out loud, so I kind of let go of that shame and just say it, say what was in the room. The other people said, oh, yeah, we know you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it felt okay. They are like, yeah, we know you. We know that you didn't mean it that way. And we also know, like, you're autistic, so it's okay. Let's go get our nails done. And I was like, oh, okay. But I think part of letting go of that shame was me saying it out loud and not trying to hide it is I guess what my story about Shane and also what I'm doing. The other half was how you're trying to navigate that. Like, how am I trying to do that? I think just continuously saying it out loud. Well, I, yeah, I agree. So like if you, what you just said is so relatable though, like um, holding shame. And then when, but then when there's people that actually get me I, I'm still in the process of learning like it doesn't offend people who like get who, who maybe it would have offended before until I learned I'm autistic and our and uh, Macy earlier you were talking about this how like relationships change and stuff and it's like somebody else said like I lost a lot of people when I got diagnosed like oh my gosh me too like it's but in my case it's like maybe I don't have as much like false support I thought I had before because there's less people but the amount of support I get from the people who get me like from a best friend who's they're not neurotypical they're ADHD not autistic and like how our relationship has changed so that if I if I if like what that would refer to as snap you know if I say something if I'm just like very blunt and it could possibly hurt someone's feelings, but nothing like bad is said, you know? I'm not like, you a-holes. I'm just like, I can, ah, you know? And something comes out. It's like, I am adjusting to the fact that people who love me get that. Like, it's not a huge thing to apologize for. I don't have to go over and over it in my mind. Like, I don't know. It's like such an amazing way to feel accepted when someone you love and who loves you back doesn't hold you to all the neurotypical norms that like I, I'm not good at anyway. Like that's when I'm actually a jerk, when I'm trying to like blend in with neurotypicals, like that's when I really lose it, like, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, I'm just finding that story really, really relatable. Um, Yeah, what helps me be my authentic self is just like you said, saying it out loud, 
Um, and I, I'm someone, I'm, I'm sure many people are like this, I need like a lot of space and time to myself. Um, sometimes I think I overdo it, like it hits a level of like, I feel lonely because I sometimes have a hard time managing like, how much do I actually want to be alone? Because I will be alone, like uh, T said something about like being in your house, like it, I'm the same way. Like luckily I, I, I share a really beautiful backyard so I get to like be outside and still feel home. But I, I don't love leaving my neighborhood. I don't like the changes that neurotypical people expect of themselves and us every day, like changing locations constantly, like transportation, all that, like these things are just give me more stress than most things do in life. I wanted to see if we could take a pause and um, give a shout out to our sponsors. Brandy, would you take the first? Yes, one of our sponsors is um, Hiki app. And uh, that is the um, autistic dating and friendship app that I actually work for, <laughs> I'm the social media and community manager. And i um, pretty excited about that. Jamil, the CEO is amazing. And um, yeah, he does a lot trying to make this app accessible and um, safe for our community. And I'm constantly coming in and, you know, looking at things, trying to see if like this is going to work or that's going to work. They're always including me in, um, in everything. And so it's, it's really cool. And, um, yeah. So if anybody is interested, um, check them out. It's a, yeah, Hiki app and you can find it on, um, like your Apple store or Google play, I believe also. And it's really cool. Thanks Brandy. And we have one more sponsor shout out. I'm going to throw it to Tiffany. All right. Um, our other sponsor is Timo, and they are a visual planning app. Um, I have been working with them for about a year now, and I not only love their app, I love their company. It feels like a family. They were the first people that ever like told me, like, you have influence and you have power with your words and they believe in me they believed in me before I believed in myself um but their app helps me so much there's and I, I use it with my kids my youngest loves it a lot because of all the pictures and the little icons and he can set up his own schedule on the computer and it syncs to his ipad so I don't even make his schedules he does his own and I just like let it go off let the alarm go off and he's well with his day and um but yeah they're great they're on um i don't know if they're on google yet but i know for sure they're on app uh, um there i, I have know. it on my android. Are they on android now i think they're on android yes. now. but i i love them and they have a really good blog section that i really don't think that they advertise as much as they should but um if you get a chance, check out their app section. It's like a lot of posts that are written by other neurodivergent people and their app is created with a lot of neurodivergent creators and people throwing in their input. And I just love them, but yeah, let's see. <laughs> Thank you both. And uh, I, I really need to close the chat, but uh, Laura Melissa, I saw you writing it in the chat. Thank you. I really appreciate that too. Um, so we just I think more. TJ also said something in the chat. Oh, Brandy, you've just, yeah. Let me read, okay. Um, oh, uh, so TJ said, I can, uh, back to the authentic self um, question. I can be my authentic self more easily with my family who are like 75% neurodivergent. I have also accidentally made almost 100% of the people in my life either autistic or have immediate family members or children that are autistic. I guess like attracts like. I've done that too. <laughs> it's like, and it's awesome. I just said um, T is having a break, by the way, too. What do you they think? might come back. T is having a break. They might come back. Um, oh, okay. They might be back in time, but they might not. So that's thing. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, so we just have two more questions. Have you established any boundaries uh, that, like, yeah, as an autistic person, uh, you expect slash ask? appreciate are upholded. I, I'll give an example that I said to uh, all of you. Uh, 
one for me is um, uh, people need to give me like a lot of warning. I, it's not just like before coming to see me, but also expecting me to go somewhere. Um, uh, I feel like the closest people to me in person know this. And I, I've said it a lot of times, but it has taken them time to figure out exactly what that means. Like they think, I, I think sometimes it sounds like, really, you want me to contact you that many times? Like the day before we're gonna set a time, we're gonna confirm it that day. I'm gonna let you know significantly before I leave. And then I'm gonna tell you when I'm on the way. <laughs> and I'm like, exactly. <laughs> and the people who love me have like, figured out how much like oh that he literally needs all of that to feel normal you know <laughs> to like have a, 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 I, I'm, oh, I think I realized maybe like a year ago how important transition time is for me uh, time feels very just like I, it's something it's very hard for me to know what time it is ever or something if something's coming like often someone will want to plan something for me they'll be like can you do this you know right now it's 245 by me if they said six I would have a little hesitancy of like I don't I I'm not I'm not sure how much transition time I need after this and like if I had if I felt like I wanted to hang out with somebody after this like it can be really hard to navigate and sometimes somebody's showing up with a 15 minute heads up totally works sometimes it's like that was not enough and we just need to cancel our plans so yeah do you guys have any things like that uh i can say that i think boundaries is something setting boundaries is something new for me actually and uh, i allow myself now to say no which is really hard for me and I understand now that I have to reserve the best part of me for myself and my immediate family members. And that includes turning things down. And so I'm allowing myself to be honest. So if someone asks me, can you read this? Can you do this for me? I'll just say, I can't do it. You can send it to me, but I can't promise you that I will be able to do it because I just can't read the comprehension. My reading comprehension is not very good. I have to like focus to read lots of words. So I, uh, I think I'm allowing myself to be okay, my good enough, uh, if it's not 100%. And I think that's something new for me. Uh, and I'm okay with it. feel happy for you to be figuring that out. I, I, I too, it's like a pretty new thing and it feels really like empowering, I think, to be like, I'm in control yeah. and, and obviously not always, but like there are times I can be in control of how my life is impacted by like my senses, by my anxiety, like there, it's okay to ask people to do things or change things or not do things so that I'm okay, you know? And not be ashamed of it. Cause I used to be like really ashamed to not um, be able to give a hundred percent. If I say yes to something, I have to be there. And if I can't do it, it caused me a lot of anxiety. And now I can just tell people like, well, I don't have the time. Secondly, I just don't have the bandwidth right now or I don't have the bandwidth right now. And I find that honesty, uh, it's important both ways, you know? So it's really empowering, yeah. I totally relate to all of that. And the boundaries are new to me as well. And, um, uh, finding out that I have, I've always been kind of sick as, um, like chronically ill, even as a child. And as I've gotten older, it just got worse. And then I found out that I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which, you know, a lot of autistic people are, um, are affected by that. And then one of the co-conditions that comes along with that is mast cell activation syndrome, which, um, it basically causes you to have like chronic allergic reactions to everything. And one of those is stress. And so if I get stressed, I 
physically feel it inside of my body. I mean, I get sick, break out in hives, um, throw up. I mean, it, you know, it just get red and um, lose my mind. <laughs> and it's so as I've gotten older, I had to create those boundaries because it was killing me not to have them. And something that I put up as a boundary that has made so much difference in my life is I um, I can no longer be around people who are not supportive of me and who aren't, um, who like I can't be around people who criticize me all the time anymore. And I can't be around people who are not good for my mental health. And that does not mean that they are bad people. It just means that they are not um, someone that I can be around for me. And, um, and so that meant cutting out people in my life um, for good um, and be, for my own mental health and my own, um, my own sanity. And I mean, one of the things with Marcel is you are, you're li literally allergic to stress. <laughs> and so if someone becomes too stressful, if that relationship becomes too stressful for me, I have to walk away. And that doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just doesn't work out for me. And unfortunately, I become labeled as a bad person myself because I walked away or I cut people off or I'm cold hearted or whatever. But it just got to the point where I had to. I had to do that because it was killing me not to. And so, yeah, I can't be around stressful people that are stressful to me anyway. So. Um, I just wanted to bring up that TJ said something um, a couple minutes ago too, and said the only boundaries I set now are that I will use texting or AAC to communicate with people and for them never to call me for voice call. And Brandy, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Like, I didn't know that. Um, but that is a common complication. I'm not sure if I'm using that word with Ehlers and Lowe's. Yeah, a really like oh. <laughs> mind blown moment. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, go go down the rabbit hole, the Google hole on that one. <laughs> a lot of info. <laughs> I think TJ, I can't find it because uh, the chat, you know, my situation with the chat, <laughs> but I think TJ was relating to uh, Brandy. Is this right, TJ? Oh, yeah, we're saying they can relate to what you're saying in terms of stress and epilepsy. I was literally thinking the same thing when Brandy was talking. Uh, so it was cool to see that kind of come up in the chat from you, TJ, because it's so true. Should we just jump to our last question and ending on a something that makes maybe maybe makes us all feel happy, maybe just helped us cope and regulate. Um, what's your go-to stim these days or today? Or what's your most uh, yeah, what's your go-to stim? You all know that I'm stem dancing all the time. Maybe you don't know, but I <laughs> that is my thing. I just move and dance. I put all my stems into one big stem and play my loud music and just let go. It's, it's my favorite stem. I can't do it always as often as I'd like. Um, sometimes it also leads to chronic pain, but it, it's beautiful at the same time. I love it. Um, and then, but my most constant stem is chewing gum. I buy a giant pack this big, which I white twice a month, and I always finish it. <laughs> I want to say, Laura and Melissa, that like I started stem dancing because I saw your reels, and I was like, that looks like fun. And I, <laughs> my partner and son, he went out. Uh, for like the afternoon somewhere, I don't remember where they went. But I like danced for like a long time. Like I was very sore the next day, but I loved it. And I was like, this is great. Uh, I think 
like I, for me, I had read somewhere else too about like just whenever you're going through this diagnosis, getting like just discovering stims and because just learning them. And I'm, I feel like I'm in that space because um, recently I was I was told uh, that I was in a depressive episode, but when I'm alone, I feel pretty good, like, <laughs> you know, and happy and whatnot. So I'm like, I think I'm just burnt out. And so I need to like lift up my energy. And so that's when I was just like, okay, maybe I need to try to stand a little bit, like see what works for me, um, maybe more active. And that's what, that's why I tried as and dancing. I really loved that. But mostly um, it's my hair. Um, I'm always playing with the hair and I don't know how I'm going to cut it so I don't think it's happening anytime soon so because I just realized as I was sitting here I'm like yeah I don't think so I'm really I feel very very nice <laughs> doing that Brandy if you're talking we can't hear you yeah Oops, um, I see all the, I got too excited by the dogs in here. I see all these dogs in here and that is like my number one is petting Scarlett, narrating her movements in little voices. Um, yeah, just taking pictures of her, petting her all the time. Like, yeah, number one right there. I'm glad she likes me because I just follow her around all the time. So yeah, and of course hair, twisting my hair and and doing this with my nails, just like flicking my nails. That's a big one. Uh, I am going to move after this. I'm going to spend time to do my route, <laughs> the regular route. And just like Brandy, play with my nails and just use my hands on something. Um, yep. Obviously my dog. Um, <laughs> and he's like, he's like standing next to me, like waiting for me. He's, I think he knows I'm like wrapping something up. He's awesome. He's actually like a seizure alert and seizure response dog. And he also has epilepsy. <sighs> yeah, wild. He's giving me like these eyes, but I would say my most common, like I will be in bed for hours, completely awake with my dog on my chest. And I don't like when I realized that was stimming, it was like, oh my God, that's, that's the best feeling I ever have is like when, and it's also the most calming feeling. I could be anxious as F, uh, but my dog will come lay on my chest and it's like time stops. I feel this like feeling inside that sometimes it's like surprising that you can feel that like without other humans around. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like that you, you know, like <clears throat> not that it's something other humans give me often but it's just like an, an amazing thing you can like feel in your body. I don't know. But, but yeah, the most constant and my longest term has definitely been my dog. But then there are little things like um, Tiffany and then Laura, Michelle, Laura Melissa both pointed out that they were holding things. And I was, before I was holding something, I was like sitting here, like not knowing what to do with my hands. And I, and I was moving around so much, but it wasn't like helping very much. And I was like, I saw you both holding things. And I was like, I need to hold something. And I just grabbed these rocks. <laughs> one time I had this like stim ball, you know, those like squishy ones. And I'm in a meeting with my advisor at school and we're really open with each other. They have ADHD and we we're talking about stimming. I was like, oh, actually I'm like squeezing this ball below the camera right now. And I was doing it so hard. I was like, I feel like I might break it, whatever. And then at the end of the meeting, it like exploded. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm a little all over the place. I had no idea. <laughs> so, yeah. Stimming. I think a stim that I didn't notice, especially because I was so late diagnosed, but un until I started reading about it was I clench my fists, like this like curling motion. And I, I, I always do it. In fact, to the point I have calluses on the inside of my hands. 
and found this out like at least six to eight months after I was diagnosed. And it, it's my main stem. I, I'm clenching my fists, like just like bracing for impact kind of thing. Um, and I think those hidden stems are so important to at least mentally uh, be aware of them. Uh, I'm going to go with um, sorting. It's um, my go-to, especially when I am uh, lacking control and I, I need the control. And like, because lately I've been going through a lot of different like things and like health issues and, and, and feeling like I just have like a complete lack of control. So Sorting is my my go to. Like I'll sort clothes, I'll sort remotes, sort trash bags, I sort different things, and I can like go back and resort them in a different way. Um, I I I was sitting here, guys, and I was y'all was talking, but I was listening. But I was sorting these M and M's. Y'all was talking. That was me doing all of that. And I'm not gonna eat. Not, but the brown ones, I'm eat the brown ones. But I sort them. And then later on, I'll probably mix them with Skittles or some other small different colored candy that makes it harder to sort. And then I'll sort those. And I'll probably either do them by color or do them by candy or do it. I just need to be in control of something. And that's my go-to because I feel like I don't have a lot of control lately so sorting is my 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 thing so whenever my family sees me sorting something they're like oh she's she's feeling some kind of way she's or I'm switching something up or changing uh or I'm in my kids room sorting their stuff and my son's in there like I need you to leave you're sorting and I don't like it <laughs> you know, so I'm like, I'm just sorted. So that's my, that's my thing. That and, well, I guess it is doing something with my hands. I was going to say, like Jersey said, doing something <laughs> with your hands, but yeah, that's my go-to. My go-to is uh, usually jumping. Like I have a trampoline. Um, I carry like very heavy balls that spin. Um, I love magnets, like any kind of magnet thing, any kind of spinning thing. Um, my worst thing is biting and picking at my nails and the skin around it, um, but I keep my nails polished, so I don't do that. But I uh, generally choose jumping if I were to choose a stem. Most stems I don't choose, they just happen, but um, the uh, jumping is the one I tend to you. I'm done. Has everybody gone that wants to go? All right, like last time, I am very awkward with goodbyes. I, I don't know if this is an autistic thing. I That's what I mean. I'm still confused like about what makes me autistic, but I really hate long goodbyes. Like when people hug each other and then stand there and talk, like I just need to go because it's just a very weird transition. Um, so if you all are comfortable with it, I want to thank you all so much and thank people who came to this again and are supporting us. Um, so while nobody is obligated to donate or contribute to us for doing this, um, it would be really amazing, uh, and you can show your support for us uh, as autistic adults by contributing to my Venmo. I'll put it in the chat. It's jersey.noah. Um, the funds will be split up amongst people attending who want to be, who want it sent to them. Um, people can redistribute how they feel. Uh, so again, the funds will go directly to us. So please Venmo. Uh, Matt, how many people are in here? Hey, Matt, can you hear me? Sorry, uh, I was muted. Um, yeah, we have 60 people right now. Cool. 
So, uh, oh, I didn't see, I could see it. Um, so 60 people, if everybody donated an average of $20, uh, that would be, I'm like, oh, geez, am I doing this math right? If everyone donated $10, it would be 600. If everyone donated $20, it would be 1200. Uh, some people can give more, some people can't give anything. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and thank you all so much last, uh, thank you to our sponsors and Tahiki and Timo and the people here. I just love you all. I feel like this is the best social thing I do. Like it's, it just feels so good. Um, so thank you. And wait, wait. it's Venmo, right? Jersey Noah? Uh, Ven Venmo or PayPal. Yeah. Venmo. Okay. PayPal. And PayPal. Somebody... Oh, no, sorry. Not PayPal. I don't have PayPal. Cash app. Oh. Somebody was asking, yeah, saying that they they can't donate because they're out of the they're out oh, of different. You can use Cash App in the UK. We have okay. Cash App in the UK as far as I know. I okay. think it just came in, but PayPal would be best. Um, so, oh, um, I do have a PayPal. Cool. Does I was going to say, if anyone PayPal? comfortable with that? That would be great. I don't remember my PayPal. I think you can just put your email in. The PayPal email and they can send it to the email. Yeah, sorry. Uh, That's actually probably pretty personal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it's> really like, <laughs> okay. There's a link in my bio that has PayPal. <laughs> well, thanks, Kiana. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, uh, if we come up with a PayPal option, uh, We'll have a PayPal option for next time. Um, for now, if you can use Cash App and Venmo, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much. And goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for your Bye. technical help, Matt. Oh my gosh, Thanks, thank you. Matt. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.